Episode 19 is with W1 retired James Fraser. Jimmy served with the British Army in various regular infantry battalions throughout his time finishing up as the RSM for two Scots, the Royal Highland Fusiliers. He's done it all. He's been a, an instructor and a leader in various levels, from teaching the newest of recruits going through the infantry training centre at Catrick, to teaching battle-hardened guys from all over the British Army on the Sixth Commander's Battle Course. His instructional prowess saw him lead the platoon commander's division at the infantry battle school in Brecon, where he was a divisional sergeant major. Jimmy's career has also seen him lead the dogs of war at all levels, which has given him an understanding of what leadership in a diverse organisation looks like. He highlights some of the challenges leaders face and identifies ways in which they can grow. Since his transition out of the regular army, he's been working with the cadets to bring about an improved and more rewarding experience for all those involved. We touch on some of the difficulties he experienced entering the new role and a new environment as leader and how he overcame some of those hurdles. Make sure you share the podcast with your boys and remember to let me know on social media how I'm doing by leaving a comment. And without further ado, the Lead Wasps podcast episode 19 is live. But uh, thanks very much, Jimmy, for 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 coming on. And um, if you could just give a, a brief introduction to to some of the listeners as, as to who you are. Well, my name is James Fraser, most commonly known as Jimmy in uh, in the military. I served twenty four years in the infantry, um, whereby in nineteen ninety six. I joined the infantry and I went through training at Glen Course, then on to the infantry training centre at Catterick. Whilst I was at Catterick, I completed the combat infantryman's course and I got the best student on the course. Throughout my time in the army, I served with the Royal Highland Fusiliers in the armoured infantry role uh, and I served in Germany and then I moved to, Fal uh, to Inverness, Fort George, again in the infantry role. And then subsequently from Port George, after a, a tour in Northern Ireland and a tour in Bosnia, um, I then ended up at the Infantry Training Centre as an instructor, whereby in my army career, I've seen myself deploy to Bosnia, Northern Ireland, Iraq, Kurdistan, Afghanistan. I've also seen myself on exercises in Canada, Poland, Belize, Germany, France, and as a corporal, a sergeant and a colour sergeant and a W2, I found myself as an instructor in the Infantry Training Centre as well as the Infantry Battle School uh, Wales, where really the Infantry Battle School Wales is where you teach infantry commanders to the craft, in essence. And how did you finish up your career then, Jimmy? Because you, you hit the big one there as well. Uh, well, I finished up my career as the regimental sergeant major of two Scots. Um, it was it was a really good career. You know, my career I could never ever turn around and say uh, there's things that I like or things that I don't like. We're always going to have challenges in life. We learn from the fellowship of right and wrong. My career ended at my at the pinnacle, whereby I was the regimental sergeant major of the unit that I enlisted into in 1996. So, you know, I was very pleased and chuffed with my efforts. Um, but that we are where we are now. You know, when you look back in things and in the face of adversity and that, there's always things that you can take away from things. And... Uh, I've got a job now, it's not a career, it's a job whereby, you know, I can dedicate 100% of my time to developing uh, volunteers in support of, you know, this current generation of cadets, which is a good thing. Yeah, that's good. We'll, we'll touch on that in, a, in, in depth later on and, and actually what your role is with the cadets uh, and we'll, we'll dive into that. But, but first off, I just uh, want to kind of take it back to the back to the start if you don't mind um what was life going up for you in terms of opportunities and stuff like that and was joining the army always always something on your mind or is it something that uh, like for myself it was a it was a kind of final straw um in a shit situation sort of pardon my language to be honest with you david um let me actually think and i need to think hard here i would believe that if I didn't join the army, I'd have probably have been in prison. 
because I was a young, boisterous lad. And based on the place where I grew up, you know, it was stricken with poverty. And the reason it was stricken with poverty was because the steelworks and the coal mines in North Lanarkshire were all closing down. So as, as a keen swimmer, I joy, uh, you know, as a, a young age, the age of seven, my grandparents, who I get brought up with, put me into a swimming team to give me some some self-discipline, some self-respect and respect for others. And by doing that, I ended up actually walking out of the swimming pool at the age of 16 with no qualifications from the school. Not walking out the swimming pool, but leaving the swimming pool after being in the swimming team um, for quite a few years, seven years it was, uh, becoming a pool lifeguard. And during my time that I was a pool lifeguard, I thought and I knew at that point I needed something well a lot more security um, and if I didn't do it I knew I was going to go down a, a road that I probably would never ever be able to return from but the biggest thing was David I left school with nothing I joined the army with nothing and I've left the army with some good life learning skills so did you did you understand that the the army was going to give you security because that's kind of something that a lot of 16 year olds don't maybe understand that it is a stable and secure job you know to be honest with you david when i joined the army in 1996 the royal highland fusiliers was something like 775 strong there was more people coming in than there was leaving um and that was probably due to the poverty at the time uh and society the changes in society um I only ever joined for three years, but but because I was enjoying it that much, you know, it was that sense of teamship, camaraderie, um, finding new friends out with the areas where, you know, you were brought up. I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a go. But it wasn't until I become a sergeant that I really realised that I'm going to make a career out of this. And it was like I woke up one night and I wanted to be that professional soldier. I wanted to be that RSM. But up until I was a sergeant, David, I'm not going to tell you any lies. I was a bit of a jack of lad. <laughs> um, and then, obviously, basic training and stuff like that. You maybe don't need to touch on it too much. But was it um, the first kind of was it a sense of realization that you had you had done the right thing when you were going through that, uh, being around, being amongst the lads and stuff like that, and then starting to really get an enjoyment for the career. I was, David, you know, I'm actually laughing at you saying that. Bed blocks for the end thing then and, you know, you get introduced to a whistle and that whistle helped you to dash down, crawl, um, you know. <laughs> but society allowed for that sort of stuff to happen way back then in those days. But it was all character building. It was all good. And I can honestly turn around and say for self-discipline reasons and for self-respect, uh, actually benefited me later on in my career when I was doing operational tours in the likes of Afghanistan where I needed to pay attention to the smaller things in life and be more detailed. So uh, it was it was at the time, what is this all about? But later on in life, you know what, I've learned from that. Uh, so it was, it was enjoyable, but it was interesting too. Yeah. And obviously, the, the, the Fusiliers isn't it? Isn't it uh... Let me just say a soft battalion. So what was it like getting getting to battalion after basic training? Was it a kind of a culture shock or, or did you feel at home as you were Jack the Lad already? Well, I think, um, David, I think I've actually told you this before when I was the Sant Major. <clears throat> it was a culture shock. You had a wee lad coming from North Lanarkshire and joining a Glasgow and Ayrshire regiment. And that Glasgow and Ayrshire regiment had so much history, had so much pride. You had the Royal Scots Fusiliers from Ayr and you had from Ayrshire, and you had the Highland Light Infantry from Glasgow. Well, I was not from Glasgow or Ayrshire. So I was seen as an outcast straight away. And you know, I would love to tell tell you the terminology that was used whenever they were, you know, uh, shouting on me or, or, or describing me. Um, but, but put it this way, I was like a settler. That's what I was like. I was like a new age settler in a, in a regiment. But I soon learned to adapt to it and it become part of the band and it become part of, you know, being part of the team, that sense of belonging. And 
my career has been brilliant, mate. I would, I would never ever turn around and say to anybody, don't join the army. The army is a great career, but I would turn around and say, be careful what you wish for in the army and take as much of the army as what the army takes out of you. Um, and I, I say that with caution because I've taken a lot out of the army and the army's taken a lot out of me. But at the same time, I'm now starting to identify that maybe if I would have invested a wee bit more in my own personal development during my time, rather than investing a lot in my soldiers because I was in a, um, a rank appointment, then I could probably have set myself up slightly better for Civvy Street, but I'm happy with my job. You know, I, I will honestly turn around and say I'm not disappointed with my job. My job's good. And I, I joined the Army, and one of my greatest achievements in the Army was having the ability to develop others. And I'm now in a job where I'm having that ability to develop volunteers and the current generation of cadets. So that's good. Yeah. Like, I'll tell anyone if they ask me... Um what the army's like or whatever and you know that I'll, I'll always talk positive but there's there's definitely some negatives that come away with it as well being away from home is a, one of the big one um and it doesn't do too great for your um you know your life back back home in terms of your family and stuff but if you're um if you're able to manage that then there really isn't much more more negatives other than some of the you know physical um impacts that are uh, uh, a physical service like being in the infantry can can lead on a soldier especially on back-to-back -back deployments and training really hard for courses and stuff like that um but how was it how was it getting to um how was it getting to germany then because obviously like you said you, you've kind of grown up in poverty and you're you took you took that decision to join the army yourself and then within what six seven months you find yourself in a completely different country in a in a a wee fish in a big pond let me say well, David, actually, I look back sometimes and I actually say to myself, Germany, what did that do for me? That actually made me the person I'm in the day. Because it made me appreciate money. It made me appreciate what I had. And it also made me appreciate my friends because, you know, I was living and working with them 24-7. On top of it, every single weekend, I was a millionaire, mate. I was down the, you know, <laughs> down the disco. I was everywhere up until that time where I started to get, no, uh, get, where I started to become um, noticed for my ability as an infantry soldier. And, you know, my name was getting thrown about to go on junior NCO cadres and that. And that's when you start to say, am I getting this right? Or am I not drinking enough at the weekend? <laughs> Yeah, because you don't you don't necessarily volunteer for those cadres. It's it's obviously somebody will tell you right. Uh, we think that you're 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 meeting the grade. Let me, let me chuck you on there, and I'm telling you, you well, you can tell me if I'm wrong. But back in the day, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have had it. Uh, how I've came to see it is that guys can ask to get on it in recent times because maybe manning isn't as great. But um, yeah, back in the day, I'm I'm sure there was no shortage of manning, and you definitely were selected rather than asked if you wanted to go on these promotional well, courses. To be honest with you, David, as I said earlier on, 775 soldiers there was in the battalion. You had more people coming in than what there was leaving. Um, it was competition. It was competition. And, you know, you could be a jack the lad at the weekend, but from Monday to Friday till you stood down at the weekend, you had to prove your craft. You had to work your craft. You had to um, learn from the people who were there to develop you. Um, and one of the big things that I always take away from the Royal Highland Fusiliers that they always betrayed that a good leader needs to know his people. And I thought, you know what, I've got the best opportunity here to understand my people because I don't come from the same social background as them. I'm not from Ayrshire and I'm not from Glasgow. So I think that that could actually have benefited me. Um, because I wasn't biased in any way towards Glasgow or Ayrshire. I was seeing the people for who they were. Um, yeah, so I, you know, it was hard being yeah. in a big pond. It can be scary. But like everything else, when you get your friends round about you, you, you know, you become mentally and physically strong. Yeah, you're almost starting to grow in terms of a social interaction that, you know, that, that you, you don't get when you're just 
let's say living on a scheme you you meet the same people interacting with the exact same people as you not getting diversity of thought or or um um action or anything like that it's everyone's just doing the exact same thing but then when you get thrown in the mix where there's a a massive bunch of people from all over the place and um you're not one of those people then it definitely it maybe might challenge someone who hasn't had that social development um early on in their life yeah 100 percent mate 100 percent but during my time in germany i decided that i wasn't going to sit about at the weekend and just sit in my room and drink in my room i was going to go out and i was going to venture and i was going to see a bit of europe and i also think that that because of my age i was 21 at the time i think that that was also another reason as to why i was identified at a real early stage in my career to go on a junior nco cadre because I wasn't the type of guy that sat back and just wasted his cell away. Not to say that people do waste their cell away, but relaxed totally at the weekend. I went out, I visited, uh, you know, the country, seen a bit of the history, a bit of the culture, and enjoyed it. And yeah. um, and then in, in terms of uh, promotion and stuff like that, you mentioned you'd done an NCO card. How quick was it before you were getting on, on juniors after that? Well, David, I think it was all to do with my um, getting top student at the Infantry Battle School. Sorry, at the Infantry Training Centre. Um, and I was, I come straight from ITC Carrick to the battalion. Three weeks later, I was on a exercise in Belize for 32 days, um, Tropical Storm. Then from Tropical Storm, was straight back to Germany, went on Christmas leave, tr from Christmas leave, straight back on a PDT training to go to Northern Ireland. And after that tour in Northern Ireland, I went and done my junior NCO cadre with the Royal Scots down in Cambridge. Um, and from there, I got a recommendation for promotion now um, because I was... I, I was doing the CADA with them, so I couldn't get promoted on the square. So I got a recommendation for promotion now. And when I went back, the commanding officer, um, who ended up being a general, General Loudon, turned around and says that, you know, you went there, you pushed the boundaries, you've not been so sure of your surroundings or the people, and you've delivered, you've proven your craft. So, you know, I got promoted on return. Um, so I was about, I was about a year and a half, a year and nine months, and I was a lunch track. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I was, uh, I was about the same, um, but I, you know, I had a different um, path to get there. Mine was pretty much just straight on tour, and then uh, come back Christmas uh, portal, and then Christmas leave, and then that first day back after Christmas leave was a uh, NCO cadre. Um, so I was kind of the same. So there is opportunity there to promote quick, but. Um, or to get on uh, on a your initial promotion course quick, um, but you you need to be you need to be standing out like you mentioned there. You need to be doing something a, a little bit above the ordinary rather than just um, you know. Yeah, above and beyond. Yeah, that, was, so, that yeah. was always a big thing that I used to always get told in the RHF. It's okay doing your job, but there's a lot of people who can do your job. Mm -hmm. If you can do that wee bit more above and beyond that wee bit of X factor stuff, then that's the stuff that will recognise you. That's not to say that you you know you've got creeping excellence or anything. It's just to say that if you've got a passion in something or if you've got a hobby, invest in it. Take the time, invest in it, and go and do something about it. Um, and that's the small things that get seen. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to guess that um, that you didn't rest on your laurels as soon as you got promoted. You you kind of took the took it by the took the beast by the reins and just kept driving on. Yeah, um, I never ever forgot who my friends were, David. And the reason I never ever forgot who my friends were was because. If your friends appreciate the army and appreciate the, the rank structure, then they'll appreciate that you've got a position of authority and they'll appreciate that you've got roles and responsibilities. The people that I did feel I had, dra I had dramas with when I actually look back on it, mate, were probably the more senior people from other companies who still felt that I was junior and no capable and that if I was in their company, I wouldn't have been capable of being a junior NCO. But the thing that I turn around and say is that, you know, 
I had a I had a tr- an opportunity and I took a choice. And when I took that choice, I made sure I was going to do as best as I could with that choice and that opportunity. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of people that have choices in life and they pick their own choice. That's the thing. You know? Like you, you can only look out for yourself. Um, no, nobody else is going to do that for you. I mean, you may get a little bit of guidance from some of your leaders, leadership in, uh, in the army, but you definitely need to be taking taking that on on your own uh, on shoulders. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, and if anyone's, you know, if anyone listening's in a position where they might be in a, and find themselves in a position where they might be able to take that little step up, but they think that their peers might not think it's the right thing for them to do, then I would just say, stop, don't listen to your peers. Your peers, if they are pr- uh, proper friends, will be only encouraging. Uh, and if they're not yeah. encouraging to succeed, then you might want to look around and get some other friends. And that's what being a team member is all about, David. And I think sometimes people seem to forget that in the infantry, we work in operating teams. You've got a team of four and a fire team. You've got a team of eight and a, a section. And then you've got three sections and a platoon. And then you've got three platoons and a company. They're all teams. And everybody needs to come together to be pushing and pulling in the same direction. If you've got one... Um, one person who pulls in the, the opposite direction, you've got you've got a problem there. But that problem doesn't necessarily be rectified overnight. It's about developing that that person to become more positive than negative and um, embrace the changes. And change is the biggest thing that we find in life. When you asked me that question there, I actually thought about the time that you came across from Recce to Alpha Grenadier Company. And I, I thought, here we go, we've got a recce soldier here. And it was during the battalion was getting reorbited and that. We've got a good recce soldier here. And I didn't know your dad, but there was other people who knew your dad. And um, I'm saying, is he going to be able to settle in? Because the soldiers in the recce are all very mature. They're very proactive. They don't wait to be told. They just get up and go. And then I've got a guy who's, you know, it fills the room with, with pride and, you know, want to be the best they can be. And I thought, is, is Cottle you're going to struggle here? Is it going to be good? And do you know what, Davey? See, after about three weeks, I actually seen that you brought something to the party. And that's something that you brought to the party was a different style of leadership because you knew how to inspire people in a way that, they didn't know because you had been in the recce platoon and then brought something from the, the recce platoon back. And I actually thought, you know what, if there's anything that I could have changed in my own career, I would have probably invested a little bit of time in support company, a little bit more than what I did because I was in the recce for a, a short period of time. It was a high mountain platoon at the time. Um, but I reckon that if I'd have stayed there a wee bit longer, I would have been able to bring something more and the duty company from fire support. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's very interesting you say that because on my side of the, the, the coin, I wanted nothing to do with duty rifle company. I was, I wanted to come back and be a recce screw. And I, you know, I did not want to be going back to a rifle company to have to deal with uh, young jocks again. But, um, but getting, getting there, I didn't have a choice. Like, it's not as if I'm going to be there and be bitter about things. And then, you know, just completely forget about building my the the blocks around me um and i was aware of the fact that i was coming from the recce and i had to uphold their standards as well you know it's not gonna not it's not gonna do anyone good if you've got someone who might be seen as being great or you know this like high flying high flying guy coming from a high high flying platoon and then as soon as he gets there he's the worst person uh personality to be around and you know not actually using his knowledge or experience to benefit others so yeah re- regardless of whether i wanted to be doing it or not i had to i had to um take it on the chin and just you know continue being being the soldier that i, that I was and i don't think any of it was conscious so I, I never really had a conscious you know thought in my head that right I'm, i need to inspire people here like like you just mentioned there but uh, no, yeah I, I, I appreciate I think, the kind words <laughs> no i think it was just you come in and you had a natural approach, mate, you know, and you find people come in and they try to be, 
they try to be somebody that they're not. They try to be important. They're not important. You know, they they try to blend, but you can see right through them. They're not blending. And you were you were just a natural, a natural sway, aren't you? And the reason I say that is because I have seen people in my army career that have been put in positions of appointment that are that are not suited to the appointment or they're not suited to the role. Um, and it's hard because, again, they've got a choice. They can say yes or no. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's where we are. I always go back and always look at my time, and you, you touched on it earlier. I like a lot about Germany. One of the big things that I liked about Germany was the fact that you would always have 24 lads out in the piss at the weekend from the same platoon or the, or, you know, 60 lads from the same company. And I can always remember a time where we we decided, you know, it was our section commanders and platoon sergeants decided that we would go to Euro Disney for the weekend. <laughs> oh, picture the scene. You had Charlie Company, the Royal Highland Fusiliers, out in Euro Disney, and there was guys dancing in the street with Minnie Mouse, Mickey Mouse, Oh, you name it, mate. It was it was hilarious, but it was being part of a team that enjoyed themselves and knew when, you know, they could play and when they had to work. And that's the good thing about the army. The army teaches you when you're in work, you're working. When you're out of work, you can play. I know there's a lot of people today. I've got um, I've got a fear of reputational damage, but reputational d- damage today is far greater than it was back in the day because it's easier now to spread bad news than what it was back in the day. Um, but no, I loved it. I loved every minute. Yeah. Um, I, I just came back, just to add on to that po- uh, portion of what you were saying about me coming across the rifle company, I'd literally just come back from juniors as well. Um, so yeah, I really didn't want anything to do with uh, duty company. But um, talk about your time at, at, at juniors at, um, and your first... Um, time going down to the battle school then? So when I went down to the infantry battle school, <clears throat> I always remember sitting in the car and I was fearful of it. And my wife was there and my, my two kids were in the back and we're driving down to take over our quarter and that. And I always says to my wife, I don't want to be that screaming skull. I don't want to be that person that people hate. And my wife says, why are you coming to that conclusion, James? I says, well, there was a belief many years ago when I went through juniors that if you could scream, ball and shout, then you were passing the course. I says, and you know what? I do believe we'll have, we've actually set people up for failure by allowing that to happen. I says, but now that we're underpinned by a set of values uh, and we employ value-based leadership, I think it's all about communication and it's all about unlocking the potential of these performers in order for them to achieve really good high standards. And when I went down there, mate, you know, because I had been at Catterick as a sergeant and I had been on Op Herrick 8 as a platoon commander, um, I had a very good wealthy experience. So the soldiers that were coming through had seen real combat. The soldiers that hadn't seen real combat only ever seen what was in a a pamphlet or a policy. But in between that, there was something that underpinned us all, and that was these values of the British Army. And that's why during my time at ITC Catterick as a platoon platoon sergeant, I invested a lot of time in value-based leadership. And when I got to uh, Brecon, I became the master coach during my time down there because I invested a lot of time in coaching, subunit coaching, master coaching and value-based leadership. Yeah, you mentioned there at the time, so you're talking about being a, an instructor on, on juniors. So, for, I don't know, let's say maybe the, the international audience because there's a few a few of them. Um, the Infantry Battle School is a, the school that we have in the UK um, or for the British Army that um, guys get sent to to become a a set commander that will lead a, a, a squad of eight um, to battle in all environments and all conditions of war. And then you've got the same school, they train 
guys to become platoon sergeants um, to support that section commander. And then at the same school is where they train platoon commanders to lead that section commander and uh, work in, in alignment with the platoon sergeant. So that school there is the complete hub of the infantry unit as a as a infantry platoon as a whole. Um, so you were down there first of all as a an instructor, right? On and you ran the you ran as an instructor on juniors. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, David. So I was I was an instructor, a colour sergeant instructor on the junior division wing. Whereby you're right, it's to teach junior non commissioned officers, lance corporals to become corporals, but to get them to understand the effect that the platoon commander wants to have in the battle space, but how they communicate that effect in a positive manner to the soldiers who may be a wee bit fearful. Um, as I say, years gone by, there was a lot of belief if you could scream, ball and shout, you could pass the course, but the course had changed and the instructors actually were changing. But it was a school where it's written in the title. It's a school. You've got to allow people to fail because if they don't fail, when are they ever going to learn? And if it's in a school environment, then you as an instructor, as a teacher, or as a coach, or as a mentor, can help them develop and help them get to the passing it by the time the course finishes. So I took it upon myself to be that, to be that dad, that big brother, that instructor that I just needed to look at them and they knew I was disappointed or you know on the the debriefs I wouldn't do all the talking I would let them bring out the feelings and then I would allude to the issues that they didn't highlight and then say that was okay or it was good or, that was very good and you knew if I says that was okay there was a lot of work on points if I says it was good it was a good attack but there is something more that you can do to make it better and if I says it was very good, don't sit back in your laurels. Help others go from okay to good. And and that's how I actually worked it. And it worked, it worked very well. Um, one of the other interesting things, you know, you talk about my time that I was there. Um, and my time that I was there, not just as a colour sergeant instructor in junior division, but also as the sergeant major for the platoon commander's division, I actually done the fan dance 24 times, <laughs> 24 times. That was including, you know, That's reservist strange. courses as well as junior division, senior division and PCD. Because what a lot of people don't realise is that when it comes to the fan dance and things like that, if they're, uh, they are short of some instructors in senior division, which is the sergeant wing, you would, you would go and assist. And I always picked my time when I would go and assist. And it would always be around about things that I liked. Uh, yeah, that was good. It was very good. How did the... Uh... And I must say... Yeah, go ahead. I must say also, during my time there, you know, I picked my things when I was there. But I also get shot <laughs> in the leg. Oh, um, really? But that was... That was a that was in our live fire box, um, and that was as a result of an error in drills, which I think is actually helping me now understand and manage risk a lot better, you know, as an individual, and help me to get others to manage risk a lot better because I've faced it head on. Just uh, yeah, what was the situation then? How did that happen? I, it was basically we were on one of our final attacks and. Um, the young lad had a stoppage in the, the LMG, brought the LMG down off the um, the bun line. When he brought it down, it was in his, you know, it was in the, the range brief and everything. You bring the weapon down off the bun line, clear the weapon, put the weapon back up in the, the bun line and go on. And just at the corner of my eye, I could see he had a stoppage. And it wasn't, it wasn't in my section, it was in the opposite section. And I says to my big friend, the big Royal Irish colour son, I says, yeah, big Ian, you need to watch him over there. And he says, okay, I leave it with me. So he's watching him, he's watching him, second stoppage. And then as he starts to walk towards the young lad, he done exactly as he was told. They brought it down. And the minute he lifted the top cover, um, the working part shot forward. There was a round chamber and that one round uh, struck a percussion cap and went off. And yeah. it just so happened it caught me in the left-hand side of the leg. But, you know, put all that aside, um, by that time that that had happened, I had faced some real combat in Afghanistan. Yeah. 
you know, and yeah, that's where that's where I can honestly say my training at ITC Catrick, my training at IBS Brecon, and everything just all came together. And I knew I was an infantry soldier and I knew that I could do my job and I knew that I could work people to do their job and get people to uh, um, achieve things that they wouldn't necessarily do on their own. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very good experience. So when I get shot, it was what it was, mate. You yeah. Know, I mean, it was in training and we learn things by mistake. You mentioned it was an error in drill, but it could have, you know, to get to that point, if you've got a guy who's essentially going to be become a screw, was it was a uh, juniors that you were on at the time? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I don't. Uh, 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 to be honest with you, I think it was actually more a, an equipment failure. I think that was actually in the report more than anything. It really? was an equipment failure. But put all that aside, you know, the the young lad succeeded. He passed the course. Yeah. I don't hold grudges because these things happen in life for a reason. Yeah. And you know what? They help us identify failings. That's exactly and what I was going to raise. I'm not I'm not looking to blame. I'm looking to identify the situation that, you know, that, that it came around. How could somebody that is highly competent make a mistake like that or get himself in a situation like that? But pressure does things to people and, you know, it, can, it kind of blurs the mind a little bit. Um, and it, if you're saying it was a, a, a malfunction, then that's completely fine. But um yeah pressure um judges the mind a little bit and you know it, it makes somebody who might ha think they've got it all together um without that pressure scenario actually realize what real pressure is um and as much as it might have just been training you know they could obviously understand that there's there's these high pressure situations that come from uh, british infantry training and just military training in general which is what guys, what, I think which is like, what builds guys' uh, confidence uh, in themselves, and in, in turn, um, I think sets them up for for success in life. Yeah, I think you're right there, David. Our training, in one sense, is elite in itself, whereby it is high pressured, um, and it's it's very much realistic in every approach where we analyze our operational environments and we bring back the TTPs and we employ them in our, you know, our tactics. Um, and we always create the most stressful environments, which helps our soldiers take that condor moment and our commanders to take that condor moment to think that wee bit more. Um, yeah, I, as I say, mate, you know, the, Things happen for a reason, but I also believe that we have got an elite set up with the way in which we develop our um, junior NCOs. Um, and I think that's how our junior NCOs actually succeed in Survey Street. You know, the, there's been a period of time there um, for about 10 years, there was a lot of junior NCOs leaving and Quite a few of them were not returning. Quite a few of them did return, but quite a few of them were very successful. Quite a few of them went on to join the police and everything else. Um, but we must retain them because we invest a lot of time in them. Um, not we, because I'm not in the military anymore, yeah. but the military must retain them. You know, um, but the, you know, our training's good. Our training is very good. And until you've been attached to, you know, a European army or um, a the Anzacs, the Australians, or the Americans, you don't realise it until you've actually worked with them. Um, but no, yeah. yeah, we we've got an elite program. I've I've said that before as well. That you know, I'm obviously very biased towards the uh, the British Army, but I have said that I, I, I in regular you know regular line work, I think we just do it uh, you know a step above, and that's only because I think that we've had so much years of success and experience. That we've uh, we've dialed it down into such a fine art, <clears throat> um, and there's there's plenty of examples of that in my own personal um, experiences. And then you know, you just ask anyone that has worked with the Foreign Nation Army. You know, there's not necessarily the not necessarily the uh, the competency that you might expect. And that's not to say that the individual soldier is incompetent, but you know, the the organisation as a whole. Um, might not be as squared away as you as you would have thought initially. 
Um, well, to be honest with you, David, when you actually think about it, you know, to actually teach on junior division and then go on to um, the platoon commander's battle course as the DSM, so the Sergeant Major era, you actually need to bring what what the junior commander is being taught across to the platoon commander's wing because these young officers have just left Sandhurst and they're then in the infantry battle school trying to get taught their craft to be a to be a, a you know an in field platoon commander. And if they don't understand how these young um, section commanders are getting taught because the instructors have not got the experience in that, you're missing something there. And I thought that that was a very good move. And it was actually mentally and physically for me, it was a good move. Um, and I thought it was a good move for the platoon commanders because I could then turn around and say to them, right, your question three, what effects do you want to have and why? Okay, these are the effects that your section commander will be thinking of during his estimate. You remember, you control the effects, you bring the, the effects together in a timely manner so that they're in sequence to take shape and, you know, destroy the enemy in essence. Um, so I thought I thought that was good. You know, I, I thought that somebody had actually looked at my career profile and went, yeah, this is this is the right guy to be moving across into the platoon commander's division. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about uh, PCD, but just let me uh, go back to juniors re really quick. Um, so at the time, you can tell me again if I'm wrong, but at the time, uh, as you mentioned, you've got guys coming back from Iraq uh, and early Afghanistan. Um, would that be right? Yeah, early. What year were you there? As on so I was so so when I was in Iraq, I was actually um, theatre reserve based out of Cyprus. No, sorry. And I was in and out of Iraq. What year were you? But what, when I was in Afghanistan, no, what I was year? in Afghanistan in two. Uh, what year were you at uh, IBS as a instructor on juniors? So I was an instructor in juniors in two thousand and ten. And I was in Op Herrick 8 in 2008. So yeah. it was like a year and a bit later. Yeah, so that's what that's my point I'm, I'm trying to, to try to bring up here. So you're there at the time where guys are, have experienced, you know, peak, peak war fighting. Iraq for a, few, a bunch of years, Afghanistan for, you know, a, a few years as well. And it's really kicking off in 2009. Um, and you're obviously, you, you're as, as an instructor, you've got combat experience as well. How was it then for, for guys to, and for yourself to come back to a training environment and have to go through that, you know, that conventional firing with blanks, you know, after just experience what it is in real life and trying to trying to put that pressure on the guys? Because I can imagine they'd have just been like, oh, this isn't what it's like. Like, I've just been doing this for six months, you know, kind of fed up with it. Um, did you feel that or did you, did, were you aware of that might be the case? I think, to be honest with you, I think because our training is elite in, in one sense, uh, because we constantly rehearse things and do things under stress, it builds a resilience up. So when you actually go into the battle space and you're actually there actually doing it for real, you're more composed because your body has built up a resilience through the time that you've been doing all the training. Um, when I went back to the infantry battle school as an instructor, I looked at it and I thought, you know what, we're rushing these guys through the estimate here and we wouldn't necessarily be doing this if it was for real life. We would be allowing them to take another 20, 30 minutes here because we would have air support, we would have guns firing from a battery, we would have people moving on the flanks, we would have snipers pinning people down. Um, yeah, so why are we creating this additional press and stress, uh, stress on the student? But the reason for it was so that they become resilient to that stress and that pressure and that and that war fighting environment. You know, so I, I always say it, mate, our training is elite in the way in which we deliver it. Yeah, and like I definitely got a sense of that when I was on juniors myself. Like I, I never understood that there was even a combat estimate and that you, as a section commander, you would have to develop a plan that would be uh, set by guidelines um, and, and have a complete and clear structure that didn't allow you to miss out anything and then almost didn't allow you to fail. 
um, as a private soldier, you just think that your sense commander is looking at the end of position and just whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You know, he's he's just going to make a, a plan out, out, you know, he's going to essentially pull it out of the sky and just, just roll with it. But there really is a, a whole heap of thought that goes into that, uh, that planning process and then, you know, delivering orders. And it's done with a with rapid effect as well. It's it is really impressive if you when you're looking in as an outsider. And David, I think that's the reason why some of your young platoon commanders, when they come straight back from um, Brecon, they apply a lot of pressure on the section commander just to get on and go on, go on, go on, go on, take the position. But they don't fully really understand that the young section commanders got a bit of combat experience, that the section commander's also um, got a good bit of knowledge uh, and has done a course that teaches him an estimate. And I always used to say to the platoon commander, says, give the section commander the room for manoeuvre, allow for him to conduct his estimate and you control the effects. Once you've released those fox hounds, it's up to you to call those fox hounds back because if you don't have a, you know, a report line, or a you know, LOE. A, a limit of exploitation, then they're going to continue to go. <laughs> but that's your control measures, and yeah. that's why you control those effects. You know, so it's it all ties in, and that's what I'm saying. Our training is is unique in itself. It's it's actually it, the full setup of the training until you've actually been and taught uh, ITC Catterick as a as a corporal, then went back as a sergeant then went to the infantry battle school as a colour sergeant, then on to the platoon commander's division, and then, you know, become a regimental sergeant major. When you actually think about the G3, G5 and G7, G3 training, G5 policy and G7 training assurance, you can see why it's designed in the way in which it is. And it's all about creating that vacuum of stress and pressure but in order to build resilience for when the day comes, um, you know, that's good. And it sets you up for success in life as well, um, having all that pressure yeah. and hardship. Um, I, I think it does, David, yeah. I think it does. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. It sets you up for success, uh, success in life. But I sometimes think about um, our leadership styles and I think it being been transformational and transactional. And I think that sometimes a lot of... A lot of our approach is, is still a wee bit too much transactional because we've got people that react based on a rank, react based on a discipline system. And I think we, we could very easily communicate more in a transformational manner. Um, and that's what I'm identifying now in Civvy Street, um, which, again, we'll, we'll talk about once, once you move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, moving on, I guess, the... Um... You've done all that. You've done all the instructor positions at um, IBS in terms of you know you've been there as an instructor as juniors and then PCD. But before you get before you can go there as PCD, you you have a, a period of a, of time as a company sergeant major with a, with three Scots. Um, obviously, I was there during that time. So um, just talk about what it is to be a, be a, a company sergeant major and how your leadership style has to change from being a, a leader in the platoon to being a leader in the company? It's an interesting one because... You have to be different. You can't, you can't be the same leader in the you platoon. Do. You do. You do. You're 100% there. You have to be a guy that the soldiers look up to. And when the soldiers look up to you, you have to be that guy that they respect to. You have to be that guy that they put trust in. At the same time, you need to put trust in them so that it's a two-way system. There's always going to be a mission with an end state. And if you know you're one up or you're two ups in 10, you'll always be able to get your men to that start line in order to support your one up or your two up. I think the way in which you do it is by being their voice and being morally strong, but in a manner that's not critical uh, or, or criticising, but in a manner that they know best because their section commander, their platoon sergeant, is not going to talk up for them the way the sergeant major will because they're 
trying their hardest to stay as clean as they possibly can to get the next rank. Some of them. So what did I what did I actually work on the most when I was Sant Major in A Company? I actually worked on investing in my people the most. And I made sure that everybody went away from there with a life learning skill. And that was either a driving license or education, English and numeracy. Um, and I also I always stood up for my guys. I can always say to the OC at the time, a grob Heatherick, brilliant big guy. I can always remember saying to him, sir, these people will follow you anywhere, but you need to be honest and transparent with them. Because the minute you're not honest and transparent with them, they'll not follow you. And 100% he was. You know, and, and that's me saying it. I'm not playing a party piece anymore because I'm not in the army. That's me saying it as it was. I had to be firm but fair. I had to be balanced, but I had to also be calculated because when you've got 60 young lads between the ages of 16 and 25, they know... They know how to pull the wool better than I know how to pull the wool because they know how to live and breathe the organisation. I had to make sure that I was in that sphere, but I had the ability to go into that, that group of people and come out of that group of people. And I think it was all about trust and respect. I think that was the key here. It was about gaining that trust and, and developing that respect, that mutual respect, because... You've got to respect them in order for them to respect you, and that's mutual respect at the yeah. end of the day. I just highlight that point that you mm. mentioned about being transparent, uh, open, and transparent with your with your troops. Um, the guys will see right through that, regardless of how good an actor you are. They can see right through that. You know, they put two and two together, and it adds up to to six. Then they're like, "Nah, something going on here. There's no, no it's, it's, something's not right." Um, but if you just tell them straight, then regardless of how crap it might be, you know, they'll, like you said, they'll, they'll follow you anywhere. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting to to hear about the, the fact that you, you knew you were conscious that you had to be calculated with, with, your, uh, with your leadership style. <laughs> yeah, I can just you imagine, do, David. I can just you imagine know you in, the, in the office <laughs> twiddling your little fingers around, how can I get the boys now? <laughs> that's that's really what it was like, Davy. You know, uh, I always remember every morning, every morning, and you would never ever have seen this. But Rob Hellerwick had so much respect for me. Where he would come to my office, he would chat the door every morning, he would brace up. Morning, Sergeant Major. I'd say, "Aye, sir, in you come." I'd sit him down, and I was like, "Right, sir, do you want to know what's happening?" <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Well, I'm going to tell you what's happening so that you're in the loop. And I would tell him. Um, but I'd also say to him, sir, remember two weeks ago you promised these young lads this coming Friday they're getting a long weekend. So what do we need to do between now and Thursday in order for you to grant that long weekend? Oh, I forgot that. Sir, if, if you forgot it, you need to make sure you, you implement it, you know, um, because you promised them. You can't just... You know, it's like giving a kid a sweet and then taking the sweet back off them, but yet they've done everything. And Rob Heatherwick was very, very good at that, where yeah. Rob Heatherwick listened and went, Sam Major, no, you're right. Um, yeah, we need we need to give them this long weekend. And Rob Heatherwick would go up and fight the, the top corridor, as we call it, Puzzle Palace, back in the day. Um, but no, it's, it's about that. If you respect your men, your men will respect you. And I think it's going to be far harder nowadays where you're now going to have men and women in the same company and you just need to have that approach that a woman is no different to a man but you'll need to be a little bit more tactile and calculated in the way in which you do it because a woman's emotions maybe not be quite as strong as a man's but there is no evidence to prove that that's just me if I was put back on this in the seat today as a sergeant major I would volunteer to get women in my uh, company, in my platoons. And the reason for that is, you know, I've seen some very good operators who are females in Afghan in 2008. And I tell you what, they've put some, they've put some men to shame. Um, so it's not to say that they can't do the job. I just think that emotionally, they've got a different 
they've got, they're connected differently. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that they aren't mentally strong, you know. And I, I will be honest with you here, you know, I'm an inclusive guy. I'm going to be honest with you, women can do the job as an infant here. Yeah, I, 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 I feel like I, I disagree with you. Uh, and I can I can tell you why I think that you know I don't want to make it too contentious of a of a topic to to discuss but I think it's uh, I think if you you change the situation just to be more inclusive and be more open and diverse employ employer and you you're doing it to essentially benefit women's rights and give them the opportunity to serve in the front line with, as as men do is and it's a privilege it is but then in the future. I, th I believe that you might be setting them up for failure long term. Think about guys who are s seriously damaged now because of post-traumatic stress, uh, TBIs, um, traumatic brain injuries, um, and they're just a whole host of other um, issues on their body. Now, it is a proven fact that women are physiologically not as strong in you know your your average your your mean male against mean mean female so you're already setting them off at a disadvantage because you, you're not going to be able to give them lighter weights you're going to have to you're going to have to give them other weights because then the guys are at a uh, disadvantage so taking that into account that's a physiological one okay the psychological impact is the long-term damage i'm talking about of having to go on combat deployments use your bayonet you know po destroy positions see your uh, see your friends get injured um and then have to come back to the uk and have to deal with that psycho uh, psychological trauma that women aren't uh, biologically uh, built to endure now am i a scientist no am i even got a a, a university education no but that's that's just my t uh, 10 pence on the on the on the subject I'm 100% in agreement you know, with you that women are physically capable of passing because there's some guys who are, you know, extremely unfit, extremely weak in the in the uh, British Army and in the infantry. Um, so there are definitely women that are physically capable, but long term, the issues are, are, are going to come back to bite the army on the foot in terms of financial compensation and then having to deal with this, uh, the, the impacts that, that, you know, come with that in terms of... Uh, PTSD and suicides at, and all I that sort at, of stuff. So I look at, David, the actual role in which a woman would be employed in. And I'm going to just use, for example, you know, I, I totally believe in, you know, that women are more than capable and I would have them in my platoon, I would have them in my company and my battalion, not a problem because I've worked and operated with them in Afghanistan. Um, there's a couple of adult volunteers, David, who... Um, are outstanding, outstanding. One of them, Daisy Burnside, second lieutenant, she would make a brilliant infantry officer. Great. She's got a dead, calm approach to life. She's as fit as a fiddle. She's no scared to give the banter out. And I tell you what, she'll put she, she'll put her, her work in where she needs to put her work in. It's the same with Lisa Farquhar, who's another uh, adult volunteer up here in the cadet force. Both get professional backgrounds, need I say, um, in civvy state, but more than capable, mate, more than capable. And I turn around and I say, would you be seen as a mother figure or would you be seen as a father figure if you were a, you know, a, um, a platoon commander? No, they wouldn't. They'd be seen as being the boss. That would be it, the boss. Because we all refer to our platoon commander as the boss or our company commander, the boss, or our commanding officer, the boss. They would be seen as the boss. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity, and I always say this, there is a lot of opportunity for females out there in the military. And I see a lot of females in the cadet force with very, very good military syllabus skills that they develop in the cadet force that they can very easily transfer into um, the infantry nowadays. Um, and if I do remember right, David, were you no part of the cadet force in Dunblane? Um, yeah, very, very shortly. And um, it was part of our like uh, school syllabus. So we had to do it for a year yeah. or I, I think there was a, like a two-year thing, but... 
um yeah i'd done it it was um like as, as i mentioned it was part of our school syllabus so we had to do it on, once a week um and i went away to the there was a barry budden camp that we'd done for like it was like a cadet competition some sort of cadet annual cadet competition something like that we went away to barry budden and done that it was uh really good it was like maybe eight or ten guys that, that i went with but it was it was good fun was that, it was, that was that was when i was sam major wasn't it and i sent you you and sam Sharpen that didn't you barry budden um, was it that time no i so i'd done this as a cadet when i was no. like 14 or something like that all right sorry, sorry yeah uh yeah. but yeah the c cadets uh, I, when i was in the cadets it was good fun um that was the first time we'd done uh shooting we d we used two twos on the indoor range um what else uh we done like we learned very basic like field uh tactics and stuff like that but it was honestly just it was just a, no. a good chance to get out in the woods and stuff like that with your with your mates and you know mess around yeah. essentially Mate. To be honest with you, did you know, you had my career profile at the start of this podcast where um, at no point in that career profile, 24 years, did I ever take the opportunity to invest in the cadet force. Um, when this job came up to be the training safety advisor of the cadet force uh, in support of One Highlanders, I hum and hawed about actually applying for it because I thought, you know what, what have I really got to offer? I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier at heart, you know, I'm a leader of men, uh, you know, I'll thrust a bayonet into the heart of any enemy. And then I thought, no, I've got nine and a half years of training experience and, I've, and then I've got 24 years of operational experience and, you know, safe systems of training. But what could I really do? And one of my greatest achievements in my army career was, as I say, was not about getting to the rank of W1. It wasn't about job satisfaction. It wasn't about financial gain. It was actually about being able to develop others, to be able to be in a position to give people the opportunity to to reach their full potential, something that I wasn't given as a kid um, because I was brought up with my grandparents. Um, and when I look at the cadet force, it's a diverse society but it's a professional organisation. And with it being diverse, what I mean by that is, is that your adults are adult volunteers. They're not employed, they're not paid. And because they're not employed and they're not paid, they're not underpaid. So you need to approach them with more of a transformational leadership style and more of a pause before you engage. And that's why I, I mentioned earlier on about um, we're slightly transactional still, where it's, here we go, it's like this, but they don't need that. They don't need a Mr. Billy Big. What they need is someone who's going to sit down with them and give them recommendations and assist them in getting the, the cadet experience out to the cadets. But, yeah, Cadet Force for me, it's um, it's helping to develop me as an individual. Mentally, it's good for me because I still get to put on a set of combats every now and again. Um, I've still got that banter with some uh, FTRS soldiers, full-time Army Reserve soldiers. Um, but I also still have the opportunity to engage with young people and help develop them, as well as the Cadet Force adult volunteer. One of the biggest things that I never ever done, which I wish I would have done, is I wish I would have had the opportunity to manage a volunteer. Because a volunteer can very easily turn around and say, I've had enough, I'm walking away from this. And see, when you start managing them, you start to realise how your leadership style needs to change. In my time in service, I've managed civil servants and I've managed people that are underpinned by a discipline system and a rank structure and job satisfaction. But cadet force adult volunteers are totally different, mate. These are people that have got a hobby and a passion for developing young people, and you need to respect that. Because if you don't respect it, there's nothing that underpins them. They'll just turn to the right and march off, mate. So I've got a lot of time. I've got a lot of praise for them. 
And if you actually knew of the amount of paperwork that these people need to produce in order for the cadet to get the cadet experience, you would be gobsmacked, mate. Yeah. Gobsmacked. Uh, and that's why I'm there. Because I could look at the paperwork. David, you know me as a sound major. I could be very, very detailed and diligent uh, and have a, a, an eye for attention to detail. But whenever I look at their paperwork, I need to look at it from two perspectives. I need to look at it from a training safety advisor's perspective. I need to read it and make sure the safe system of training is in place. I then need to look at it from a cadet force adult volunteer perspective, whereby I'm looking at his, his or her experience and knowledge in defence writing and in the training. Remember, it's a, it's a military syllabus training. So that could be a firefighter that's delivering a section attack. That could be uh, you know, a surgeon that's delivering the platoon attack. So you're saying, mm, but you can't get upset, mate. Yeah. But when you look at it from a TSA perspective, you just need to make sure that the safe system of training is in place, that the right phone numbers are there, the right action points are there, and RB points for ambulances and everything else. It's a very good organisation. Um, I don't know if you want to jump into it just now and we can continue talking about it or if you want to move on to something else, but I'm a great believer in it's really diverse and it's diverse for three reasons. And one of the reasons are that the adult volunteer and the cadet force come from different professional backgrounds. So they, they bring a different style of leadership to the party. At the same time, they're all... So they've got different understandings of the Y generation, the Z generation, and everything else. Mm -hmm. And the big one is they've got different levels of ability and experience. Uh, and that's where you're playing, you're playing man in the middle and trying to keep the balls in the air so they don't <laughs> hit the ground so that the cadets can still enjoy it. And I always say that the cadet force adult volunteer is the magic within the wizard's wand because you wave the wand and the cadet force adult volunteer makes it happen. Yeah. yeah. So it, That's pretty cool. I think that a lot I think that a lot of ex serving members could actually benefit from the ACF and even uh, RFCA, which is um, a, an organization that works in support of the ACF or HRFCA, whereby you know there's an opportunity for you still to place on a set of combats. There's an offer, an opportunity for you to have a sense of belonging. There's an opportunity for you to still fall within a rank structure. And at the same time too, you, you, you build on new friends and there's camaraderie. Um, I think mentally and physically, for a lot of people that leave, and you know the stress and pressure you go through when you're a service leaver, um, the cadet force adult volunteers, uh, sorry, the cadet force, the ACF or the CCF or HRFC or RFCA would be a very good employment, uh, you know, organisation to look at, because yeah, you'll get that sense of belonging, you'll get that sense of achievement, yeah. and also. Yeah, they continue to develop. David, would you ever have thought that I could ever have been a D or V assessor, Duke of Edinburgh assessor? Oh, I know how I know how rigid you are, so I, I probably would have said yes. But in terms of the actual, <laughs> in terms of the actual, um, yeah, organisation, I don't think I would have said yeah. And you know, to to give your time up and you know get go down that that pathway, but just. Going back to the start about that, then how did this? Uh, how did it all come about? Because I'm going to assume that there was a, a you know a good few options on the table for you. But by the time you were leaving, like in your transition, you've got a lot of time to think about what career you might want to take up and what you w might want to do afterwards. So how did this cadet role come in, and what is the the yeah. actual role that you're doing right now specifically? Right, David. So when I was actually leaving. I was actually thinking about having a new career. I was actually thinking about joining the NHS and becoming a nurse, mate. I was spending a lot of my time looking into it. Um, and I, I thought, you know what, it'll get me into another uniform. It will give me a sense of achievement. 
uh, and I'll be able to learn a new craft and, and, and identify new friends. And it just so happened that one day I was coming out of the officer's mess. Don't tell anybody about that. Uh, sorry, out the Sam's mess. Don't tell anybody about this. But my phone buzzed. And I took my phone out of my pocket as the RSM. And I'm walking towards BHQ looking at my phone. And it was a message. And it was for the cadet force. Mr. Fraser, it would be great if you could have the cadets. And I was like, ah. And I looked about and I went, nobody's seen me. Phone back in the pocket, straight up into BHQ as the RSM. I'm like, ah. We tweet back. Oh, I would love that opportunity. And um, uh -oh. and also Major Harvey, who's OC of the cadet training team. I'd worked with both of them before in the past. And um, they turn around and they say, James, in the next six months, there may be a job coming available in Inverness. What's your career profile like, your background? And when I explained it, and I explained that uh, units, uh, health and safety advisor, this, that, and the next thing, they were like, ah, you would be ideal for this. With having the understanding of the safe system of training and also your coaching and mentoring and, you know, what you're doing in Civvy Street every weekend with referee and rugby and the likes, you would, act, you would fit in, not a problem. So I was actually a wee bit, do I go for it? Do I want to really be back in a set of combats? Do I do I want to be putting myself under pressure again? Or do I just want to go and have a clean break and have a new career? And I, I come home and I was sitting with my wife and my wife says, James, I don't think I could ever see the soldier leaving you. And yeah. I went, eh? <laughs> she says, you're too indoctrinated, James. She says, I could see you in a hospital in a set of scrubs. She says, but I don't think you would go on. I think you would get upset very easily. Uh, and I think also... You, that you, you, you'd, end up you'd end up volunteering for the Peace Corps or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> she says, I think you would get emotionally tied to some of the um, the patients. And I was like, ah, oh, right. Okay. So I went back to um, Gavin Mooney and I says, Gavin, um, where do I uh, monitor this job to see if this job is going to come available? And then you know what it's like. The army is a big is a big organisation. Um, there was a couple of people who were talking about it because it is a it is a good job, mate. Um, as I say, it's a job. It's not a career. Um, and I applied for it, mate. And my career profile seen me through to the end. And you know, I can honestly turn around and tell you, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. Uh, and when I say I'm enjoying it, it reminds me of a pantomime that I used to go to every year at uh, Glasgow, King's Theatre. And he used to turn around and say, you tell me you're enjoying it and I'll tell you I'm enjoying it. But I'm enjoying it, you know. So that's, that's very good to hard, hear, though. That's good to hear. So you did mention, briefly you mentioned it was a job and it's not a career. So I take it you do have uh, ambitions to start another career then in the future? Um, to be honest with you, David, if, if anything unto reward was to happen in this job, yeah, I probably would, yeah. mate. I probably would. Um, and I think that I've not lost, um, I've not lost focus on um, the NHS nursing because, you know, for many, many years, I was trained to hurt people and to put people in the ground. And then all of a sudden, I want to be that person that helps people to stay out of the ground, you know? Um and I've also found that I've been doing a lot more charity work too since the time that I've um, left the service because you don't really understand until you leave how respectful you are um, for your service and how respectful you are to society. Um, and the reason I say that is because the taxpayer pays your wages. And when you get out into Civvy Street and you see that the taxpayer is paying your wages, but there is people struggling in Civvy Street. Um, I just, I don't like to be a martyr or anything, but I like to be somebody that can help and assist. Um, and I just think that's my way of giving some my career. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's uh, I, I completely understand um, uh, where you're coming from with that. I've, I've kind of been the same, like, 
uh, I was earning a good bit of money there uh, at the start of the year before COVID, and uh, me and my missus were, were just giving out hundreds of hundreds of pounds a month to the wildfires in Australia and then to the NHS, and you know, it's like it makes you feel if you're able to do it, like that's obviously don't go and make yourself skint but if you're able to do it it does actually make you feel so good um and yeah. since then uh, since that um um like we were donating a, a bunch of money um obviously covid hit uh and i lost my job so instead of just sitting on my ar- um, on my arse I, I went and volunteered for a uh, team rubicon you ever heard of that team rubicon team rubicon it's a sen- it, it it was a uh, it's called um uh op react right now and basically it's a veterans it started off as a veterans based uh chari- charitable organization that that responds to disasters and helps in the relief you know it started off in america post hurricane post flood whatever um and then it, they've done a lot of stuff in places like haiti and uh, barbados and jamaica post hurricane and all these sorts of things um and then it merged over to the uk um and you know i just seen on on uh, on linkedin one day when i was job searching that they were looking for volunteers and nothing in, nothing in specific that 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 they just wanted volunteers for the upcoming taskings and then about two weeks later i got a text team rubicon's asking for volunteers up in dundee at nine wells uh to help for uh two weeks i was like i'm not got a job i've got nothing else on i may as well go so i was up at nine wells for two weeks uh during covid just uh delivering patients to and from hospital helping with covid transfers helping people with dialysis get to their to their uh renal appointments um and it like you said at the same time like if i was in what the chances of me giving up a two days of my, of my leave to go and volunteer absolutely zero you do because you do leave and you you do become thankful and grateful for the the people outside of you and it's because you realize how hard life is because when you're in the army it's really very easy you know your job is super secure you're not getting kicked out you're just not um and if you are going to get a, a redundancy then there's a good packet that comes with it um but yeah but when you're in Civvy Street, job security is not one. It's not something that's ever comes into your mind because it just it's, isn't a thing. No, you're a hundred percent right there, David. And you know, I, I've got. I could say I've got two young kids, but I've no. I've got a son that's twenty one, and I've got a daughter that's twenty. Um, although I don't look it right enough, um, but um, yeah, my son he is a. a Chief tech with Mercedes, you know, he's he's going through all his apprenticeships and everything else. And my daughter, she works in Ragmore Hospital. And, you know, see their friends, mate, they're on zero hour contracts. And that's what I mean. Nothing is secure on Civvy Street. And that's why I'm saying, you know, I'll never ever stop thinking about that second career should, should I need to uh, take it up. But right now, I'm enjoying my job because... I really think that I've got so much to offer because of my 24 years experience, my operational experience and my experience in a training establishment where I can help develop the cadet force adult volunteer who is the backbone to the cadet experience. But, you know, like everything else, the cadet force adult volunteer must remain coachable and humble and also have a willingness to deliver the cadet experience, because see the minute they lose that, they've lost the, you know, they've lost the will to engage in their hobby. Um, but it, it's the likes of me that's helping them remain focused and staying in that hobby. What things have I identified um, during my time that I've been out in Civvy Street that are transferable? Well, I think that the army gives us good communication style. Uh, a good communication style it also allows for us to be um, more more positive about our approach and we are very much not risk averse and we're resilient to a lot of things so I've actually thought about it and I've said to myself well what about a career in risk management I want about a career in the ambulance service as a resilience officer. Um, I think that's what you call it, a resilience officer, because our training 
has developed us to be resilient to so many different things. My only big concern is that, and I said it earlier on, you know, as you go up through the ranks, you spend more time in assisting in the development of others and you lose focus on yourself. So you need to invest personally in yourself. And I think that if there was anything that I would have done before I would have got out, I would have developed in my own personal uh, education because I've had dyslexia for you know 44 years. I've lived with it. I've you know I've had it for four. I've learned to accept that. But my biggest thing that I think the army could help me out with and help a lot of other people out with is. Give them lessons on how to communicate effectively with the current generation. And the reason I say that is because we are very much transactional sometimes in the way in which we do things, in the way in which we say things. We're dead hard on, fast on, we're hands on people. And sometimes we'll just say, stop, no, that's not how you do it. But you're not in a position to say, stop, that's not how you do it. You should actually be taking the time out and sitting back and saying, uh, excuse me, sir, see off, uh, see off the record, can we have a wee chat about this? And can we talk about this? And can we talk about that? And can, you know, and do it that way. And that's that's what I'm learning just now. And that's how the cadet force is very good for me because mm -hmm. there's so many different professional backgrounds with so many different leadership styles. And they're helping me to communicate in a manner that, I never ever knew, but it's starting to become what I know best. Um, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of mu mutual respect there that you're you're bringing up. You know, like like you mentioned earlier on, you might be training surgeons and the way that you're talking to people, you may, the way that you're communi commu communicating with others. And I'm going I'm going to guess that you you learned a lot of that from your time in the army, uh, in terms of talking to different types of c people of class, in terms of rank and talking to, to different pe people, uh, different forms of communication and, and the mutual respect that comes with all that in, in terms yeah. of who you're talking to. I think you're, you're bang on, David. You do, you learn a lot in the military, but as I say, you just need to be cautious that you, you don't become transactional. And what I mean by transactional, that you you don't think that you're Mr. Billy Big and you turn around and you start you will do this because you think you've got a rank on your chest and, you know, you've got a discipline system that, that makes them support you. You just need to be more persuasive and uh, transformational in your approach. Uh, and I think it's all about, it's all about gaining that respect. That, that's what it is, mate. It's all about that. So if there was anything that I would say to anybody to do before they leave the army, I would invest in my own personal development, and that would be my education. Um, and I would take up the offer of doing the leadership degree. If you've got those credits, I would do that. The other thing I would do is I would have a look and see if there's any uh, communication style courses out there, and I would invest in them. We have got a lot to offer based on our resilience uh, to stressful situations. And also we've got a lot to offer based on our hands-on approach. Our leadership is second to none. We can bring a team together and we can get a team to all push and pull in the same direction. Um, but sometimes we're too direct in the way in which we do it. Um, I also use the SRU to help me with, with that sort of a communication style. And I, I, I call it transferring the responsibility back to the person that owns it. And it's a psychological approach. It's like when you give a pre-match brief, you're telling them what you want from the game. And I know you're a very good rugby player, David. You're telling them exactly what I want from the game in the pre-match brief. When you then go out onto the field, what they don't want is a whistle getting blown all the time. So you blow the whistle the first time, hand up penalty guys, high tackle, remember pre-match brief. And then the next time you're like, captain and you come, I need you to take ownership of this and bring the high tackles down. So the captain then goes away and communicates to his people, bring the tackles down, guys. Next time, another high tackle captain and you come, bring the player in. I did tell you that you needed to own it. This is the last and final warning. If you don't own it, irrespective of the failure in law, someone's going to the bin. 
next penalty card, where you go, told you. Mm -hmm. So the team owns it, the captain owns it. He's got his roles and responsibilities. It's just you've got a different way of approaching it and you've got a different way of passing the message across. And I think that's where you become more transactional and you start to understand what is um, what would be um, material and immaterial to the aspect to the play, especially in a rugby field, but what is material and immaterial to the cadet experience uh, and deliver a safe system of training. Um, but no, I, it's, it's good, mate. And, you know, I've... I don't know if you're in employment now, if there was any jobs that come up for the ACF, I would tell you, have a look, mate. Yeah. Um, there is some very good jobs out there. And, and knowing your background, knowing your, um, your your qualifications and your style and everything else, and coming from a private school too, I think you would go on absolutely great, mate. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'm look, not trying to steal you. No, no, I'm no. not trying to steal you. I'll, I'll look <laughs> into it. I'll look into it. Um, like I said uh, earlier on, um, and like you've just said there, but the SRU, I think exposure to different um, environments in terms of, you know, it might be corporate, it might be sports, it might be military, it might be the cadets. The more you're exposed to, the more uh, diverse your your um, your thinking becomes, and the more um, that you can pull out of your, you know, pull out of your brain to use, you know, and and your and your life. Um, the more the more exposure you've got, it just it just builds a character and, and it builds a person into something a bit better than if you're just living the one thing, the one industry, the one military life, or the one you know. If you're just all you're doing is nursing, and you're not doing anything else other than nursing, then you're just you're you're not growing because all you all you're exposing yourself to is that one avenue. Whereas if you get out there and you do do sports, or if you do become a referee. Or if you do what uh, you know, you know, invest or read or whatever. The more you're exposing yourself to, the more uh, the I don't even know yeah. what I'm trying to say, but the better you're, you're going to be you, for it. No, you're creating a growth mindset. That's you're it. constantly building. You're creating a growth mindset. You've not got a fixed mindset. Um, I think you're bang on there, mate. And the reason I say that is. Um, as a referee, whenever I'm refereeing a community game of rugby, you know, I'll never ever referee that the same way in which I would referee a national game of rugby. So you know yourself, you've got the three national leagues. You couldn't, and the reason you couldn't is because there is more chance of a serious injury or a fight in a community game of rugby than what there is in a, a national game because the national game is more tactile, uh, tactical and they've got a better understanding of the laws, and they're, they're more respectful because they employ the um, the values of rugby, solidarity, respect, and everything else. Um, There's more risk so for right. the organisation as well. Yep, and you're right. Um, you do. Your brain grows. You grow in strength uh, as you invest in other things out with your own uh, employment or your own career. And I think that you could honestly turn around and say that was actually a part of the making of me too, was becoming a referee because it helped me appreciate that um, you're going to have people talk back to you in life <laughs> and way being in the army and having a big rank on you, you can't just turn around and say, you, guard room, are you six and tens, are you, you're getting agide. You know, you need to approach it in a different manner because society's changed in such a way that, you know, people are more respectful, they're more humble, and you know what, they've got a lot more to offer because of uh, their skills with the use of technology and everything else. Mm -hmm. I always turn around and always say to people, our current generation of cadets today learn from technology. It's the same way society. You walk by a secondary school and every single member of that secondary school is on their phone like that. See, if you go into schools nowadays, they're using, they're getting kids to use their phone to engage in presentations and everything else. So they're utilising the, you know, the materials. I think that the army is pushing in the right direction. The cadet force is pushing in the right direction. Um, Technology changes really, really fast, but we all need to get better at communicating in a yeah. smarter manner. Uh, how, and that's what I'm saying. How have you found uh, entering in, uh, entering the, a new, diverse environment then, in, or organisations such as the cadets? Is it 
has it been something that you've struggled with or has it been something that's been easy enough to deal with but it was just a challenge no Davey I'll be truthful and honest with you mate I struggle with it um, the first three four months um, I come in and I didn't tell anybody what my, my background was so I I didn't really say anything to anybody. Um, then after three months, I decided I was putting out a pen picture, um, which was a, a career profile of myself. Uh, and then uh, I put that out in order to try and create some mutual respect and tell them what I had to offer. And hopefully they would engage in me, whereby I seen, I seen um, a lot of Cadet Force adult volunteers engage with me. You know, you're always going to have people who that's not how we do it. This is how the cadet force do it. I always turn and say to them, well, if you've got that mindset, you're never, ever going to embrace change and move on. Um, but it was hard. It was hard initially. And still today, David, you know, it's like everything in life. There's always challenges out there. Uh, and not everybody, David, believe it or not, not everybody is going to like your opinion. Um, but you just need to become resilient and you need to remain focused and remember that you're never ever going to always be like in life. <laughs> I'm I'm fine with not people not liking me anymore. I used to care. <laughs> it used to drive drive me when I was younger, but uh right now if nobody well, maybe not nobody, but if a handful of people liked me, I'd be completely fine with it. Um yeah, as long as I feel like I'm doing good, then I, I'm I'm completely fine with people making their own opinion David, of me and, and thinking their David, own things of me. I think you're 100% right there, mate. You know what? Another thing that I've realised where I've left the army, I don't need to play the game. I can be myself. I can turn around and say, nah, no way. <laughs> yeah. I walk away, yeah. you know? But I wouldn't do that to an adult volunteer. You see? See, I've, I've, got, Jamie, I've went the complete opposite. I went the complete opposite. Whereas in the army, I could say what I want because I was never getting fired. And I most often, most of the time, I, I did open my mouth. I mean, it might, it might not have been the greatest thing for my career, but it never stopped me in terms of promotion and stuff like that. But in coming to Civvy Street, you can't talk your mind. If I was to talk my mind like that, I'd be, you know, in fights. I'd be, you know, I would be unemployed. I would, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing well off. And I've become so conscious of the fact of what i'm saying to people now even in terms of like an informal chat at a coffee house to to talk about you know work or whatever i'm going there and i'm making sure that i don't slip up like i'm consciously making sure i don't slip up because every interaction you have with people on the outside is an opportunity for them to pass on to somebody else about how good you are and another opportunity for you to maybe land that that dream job whereas if in, when you're in the military you're not going to get fired for re for for bumping your gums and if you've got some good points to raise then you know it might actually be do good for you um i used to always get told i was i was over over arrogant um but my combat to that was that no i'm i'm a subject matter expert of my my subject i know my subject and i know things yeah. aren't going right um so i'm going to i'm going to tell you uh, whether you like it or not i mean like i said a minute ago it's not the right way to do things it definitely isn't, but that's just how I was when I was a bit, bit younger. Um, and like I, like before, it wasn't conscious. It's just who who I was back then, and I'm definitely a different person now because I had to adapt to the environment. You know, you need to adapt yeah. to your environment as as you as you get older, as you change, as you go into a different job and stuff like that. And I'm sure it was the exact same for you going into the cadets because that seems like a, a complete alien environment. As much as it's still military involved. It seems like it's you know a very very alien environment to who you're who you're having to work with on a daily basis who you're having to um you know mentor and lead um, and that's what that's what i'm saying david you know when i talk about being transactional and transformational transactional can very easily be seen as passive aggressive in the way in which you communicate some sometimes and when you're communicating with you know i hate using the words but civvies when you're communicating with civvies, they've got a different approach, a total different approach. It's not that they're, um, they're, they're softer or anything. It's just that the leadership style that they've been brought up to to, um, to be within has been such that they've communicated totally differently. Um, 
one of the big things that I do do with some of my friends, we Scotty Curry and that, whenever I meet them, I, I will ask, do you still need to talk uh, as if you know the shop and uh, you, you know what you're doing and everything? Whereas I would just be like, oh, no, nah, sorry, sorry, I, I don't know, I don't know what I'd be doing there. So I, I need to ask somebody that you know knows what I'm doing because that's the way it is in Civic Street. Yeah. You know, you, you're not going to set yourself up for failure. You're going to be truthful and transparent. But in the army, there's a lot of people who actually turn around and say, "No, I can do this, and I'll bluff this, and I'll bluff that." But at the same time, they always get found out. They always get found out, David. You know. Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed my time in the army. I think you know now looking back. Some days I say, oh, I wish I was back there. Some days I'm actually saying, I'm happy. And you know what? <laughs> I'm happy, mate. Um, I can honest, I, I can, I can honestly say I've got a bit of a mannerism tonight, but I can honestly turn around and say that the um, my time in the army has been such that I've now got the tools and the tool bag to hand over to the cadet force because I've had a hard infantry career like yourself, Pam. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's what, it's what uh what's been your your career highlight um in terms of maybe deployments and then in terms of a uh, uh role person individual role. You know, I actually thought about this when I was out in uh, Iraq, out in Kurdistan two years ago, and it was Sergeant Major Crosby from the American Army. And he, he had a he had a platoon from I think it was seven platoon. Sorry, it was four platoon B company. And he went round every single soldier. And this was the top command sergeant major of the American Army. And he's like, What's your greatest achievement? What's your greatest achievement? What's your greatest achievement? Mm -hmm. And the jocks were coming at me all sorts. Oh, I love the fact that I get 20 grand a year and I love the fact that you know I'm a <laughs> lunch jack and, I, and I'm saying to myself hopefully, hopefully he doesn't ask me that question you know I'm the RSM and I'm saying he better not ask me that question but um, it took me a couple of days mate to actually get to the bottom here I don't think I've ever had an absolute highlight what I have had has had the ability to help develop others. I could honestly turn around and say that one of my uh, best memories, I've got three really good memories. One of my best memories was being the uh, Saint Major, a royal, uh, our, the Royal Guard, where yourself was, David. I thought that that was brilliant. It was basically an operational tour, but in the homeland Britain, whereby, you know, you had to give jocks the ability to be jocks uh, and to be young guys and girls. Um, at the same time, you needed to be professional. And I don't know if you can ever recall, it was our clerk, and I'm not going to say his name, but I got the clerk to put on detail that no cars had to be taken to Ballater because the, the police had mentioned that there was nowhere to park them and everything else and that a lot of the community would complain about them. And within 48 hours of being there, um, we get a phone call from the police and the police says, there's a car parked up down the side and it belongs to blah, blah, blah. And I'm saying, nah, can he? He went, no, it is. It belongs to blah, blah, blah. And I went, Okay, I put the phone down and I turned to the clerk and I says, your car, where is it? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I says, where's your car? He went, uh. I says, where is it? He went, it's around the corner. I says, okay, you've got 24 hours to get that car out of the baller and be back here. Okay, I says, <laughs> and then you've got seven days worth of restriction of privileges uh, and I'll get you in front of the OC and when you come back. And he come back and he says, sir, why is that? Why is that? I says, well, it's twofold. I says, because if I remove you, I'm reducing my, uh, my effectiveness here in the company and the boss's effectiveness where we've not got a clerk. Uh, sorry, if I remove you. I says, but at the same time, if I remove you financially, it's not going to be beneficial for you. So I'm going to play the game with you and I'm going to be really balanced here when I say, you're going in front of the boss and this is what you're going to get. Are you willing to accept it? And I shouldn't be telling you what you're going to get. And he went, 
Aye. I says, are you happy with that? He went, aye, because I'm getting to stay here and I've still got my money. I said, oh, happy days, in you go, you go. You know, and that's the way it was, Davey. So that was one of my, mm. uh, my, my memories was the Royal Guard. You had to treat people with respect and you had to treat them like adults um, because it was like an operational tour, except it was in Scotland. The other one, uh, Davey, was my 2008 tour in Afghanistan where, like yourself, you know, seeing real combat, um, yeah, had had the ability to command a platoon because we were short of a platoon commander. Um, done really well there, and I hate saying it, but my my motto was never to leave there with a ghost or a spirit, um, and we didn't, mate. And that wasn't just done to me, but that was done to. The, the full unit that was done to the way in which people operated, the way in which people, you know, respected one another and everything else. So, you know, that was that was another one. What and then it? my what, last what? year, you, my last year, I could honestly say was was it RSM? Surely it has it? to be. It, it was. It was. It was RSM, mate, and it was marching back into that camp. As a regimental sergeant major of where you joined the army. So two Scots were based in Glencourse, Barracks and Pennycook. And that's where I went my very first day training as a as a young soldier. But to actually walk into that camp and put that big badge on and be the RSM in that regiment that I joined was was good. Was good. And when I left, mate, you know. I was broken hearted, but at the same time, I left, mate. Yeah. I left and I handed over my, my TOS that I had for many, many years to the youngest job in the battalion. And I says, it served me well. I hope it serves you well. And I also went out my way to shake every person's hand in that battalion as I walked out the camp. I walked over, shook everybody's hand because you know what? Every man and woman is as important is as 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 important as the other. Mm -hmm. Um and without me, what sorry, without them, there wouldn't have been me. So yeah, that's my three my three biggest highlights. Um yeah, really good career. Like yourself, enjoyed every minute here. It's got its ups and downs. I'm now in a job. I'm enjoying the job and I believe that the job's got a lot to offer people who leave the service as service leavers because you'll know there's a lot of stress when you leave uh, and it's it's all based on that security and what qualifications you've got that are transferable. Um, I just think that we need to get better in the way in which we communicate our, our transferable skills and the big one is communication still. Yeah. Two things I've, I've uh, thought about since leaving and, and um that i've raised one of them before i think but maybe not the other is uh that would seriously help serving and guys getting out so this is pretty much for just anyone but i really do believe that the army needs to financially educate people uh, in terms of how to deal with uh, their finances as they as they as they occur because almost everyone lives paycheck to paycheck you know month to month they live by that wage <laughs> Um, and if, if there was financial education dispersed out through a, a guy's career, then he would be able to take advantages of getting a tour bonus, advantages of understanding how they can best use their long service advance to pay to get a deposit on a house. And they could maybe get that earlier in the career so they can then pay their house off earlier and, uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, yeah, it, could actually, in... it could actually be seen as an incentive to keep them in, retain them longer. Yeah. Um, I can honestly turn around and say, but David, back in the day, and I'm talking like an old sweat, back in the day, an old veteran here, um, <laughs> but back in the day, 1996 to about 2001, 2002, when I was even a screw at Catterick, the, um, there was, the, you know, the AGC would deliver presentations on financial uh, support and everything else. And I know that you can still get it as an RSM because you just need to go and speak to your REO or your RCMO. You can still get it, but it's yeah. not it's not part of the 
the syllabus. It's not yeah. part of yeah, that's you what... know your man your mandated briefs that you get annually. Yeah. And you're right, you're right. Soldiers live like pop stars, mate. Uh, and I say that even when I was a fusilier in the lunch jack, I was Mr. Versace every weekend, <laughs> you know. But come the third weekend of the month, I couldn't even afford a bag of chips. But we all learn, yeah. you know. Uh, I'm talking more so in terms of like a, an actual education. So let's say you do a week's course or you know how you do all these different things that, you know, right, we've got this going on this weekend camp, but, you know, all these 12 guys are going to do that. It's Normally it's a load of random stuff and it might be a week, it might be one night or one morning over 52 weeks um, for six for four hours a day or whatever over over a bunch of weeks. Um, but I think an actual like a course, some sort of course or some sort of like progressive ed uh, education in finance would be fantastic. It, as you say, I think it would retain a bit more, a bit more guys because they are with that education comes a realization that they actually do end up getting paid well when, when they get up into the ranks. Um, yeah. Because you're not going to get paid a decent wage like um, like you get paid as a screw or as a sergeant and you know uh, yeah. higher up ranks when you get out um unless you get very lucky or unless you 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 work on the fact that you're educated yourself uh which yeah, is my well, other that's, point which is my other point and that's david that's why i say you know if there's anything that i would have done i would have invested a little bit more time in more personal development um i'm a great believer in that the education system is good within the army um, I do think it could be better, like yourself. I know that there's Project Castle out there just now, which is looking at, uh, you know, the return of service and the education system and everything else. What is my truly and honest opinion of it? I think that, um, like the American Army, over a certain period of time, you can actually walk away with a, a fully recognised qualification for civil street. Um, and that can actually allow for you to get a job in the same sort of a wage bracket that you're in just now. But I do know that um, I think it's Project Castle is taking place just now and it's it's looking at all that stuff. So, you know, it, it's something that they're probably looking at and they probably will change in time because it, it's like everything else. It's changing as um, the generations are changing and they're identifying the new norms. Um, but, yeah. Spot on. Uh, uh, do you really have anything good. anything to leave? Any words of wisdom to leave uh, leave your cadets that might be listening? Well, I mate, and I have, and I said it right at the start, and it was something that I made sure I always done as a sound major. My beliefs and my values will ultimately create behaviours in me, but those behaviours that I have will influence the attitude the soldiers that follow me and the performance of the soldiers remember how you talk to people remember how you approach people and be courteous and polite at all times because manners mean nothing but at the end of the day they mean everything to the people in Savvy Street yeah <clears throat> couldn't agree anymore <laughs> all right Jimmy we'll, we'll we'll call it a night there um uh, if you've got any links or anything, they'll they'll be down in the bottom. And we'll get them offline. Um, but yeah, let me just say again, thank you very much for spending uh, spending your evening with me. Um, and I know that a bunch of guys will enjoy hearing you um, talk on a whole host of subjects. Maybe you know what, mate? It's mad, isn't it? It's mad how the world evolves. You were once one of my my young lunch jacks, and I was fearful of you coming across and. <laughs> The night I'm sitting here having to take a wee sip of beer to calm my nerves because <laughs> big Davy or yours put me on the camera and he's going to interrogate me. And, you know, where are we, where are we? You yeah. know, it's, it's one of these things. And I, I really mean it when I say it, mate. If you get the opportunity offline, come speak to me. Um, I'll give you some links to um, where I think you could look to see for jobs in the cadet force um, and also the cadet training teams. It's uh, it's, a, it's an interesting job, mate, and you would love it. Spot a on, lot mate. of self-achievement and yeah. self-gratification. Yeah, that's great. All right, mate. All right, mate. Thanks Cheers. very much. Have a good night. Take care. Cheers, Davey. Thank you very much, mate. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.